Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join in the conversation. Call us with your questions or comments at area code 808 374 2014 or tweet us at ThinkTechHI. For the vast majority of people living in the U.S., April 15th is tax day the deadline for submitting our federal and state tax returns. If we're fortunate, we learn from this process that Uncle Sam will be sending us some nice, fat refund checks. However, for those of us whose roots are in Cambodia, April 15 is a far more significant day. It's Cambodian New Year. Cambodian Americans and others from Cambodia will use that day to memorialize friends and family they lost during the Pol Pot regime and in the so-called killing fields. Thousands of Cambodians died during that time. Some were executed as enemies of the state. Others were worked to death in re-education camps, and still more died of starvation and sickness as they fled the violence. People ran with nothing more than the clothes on their backs, many of them carrying babies or elders. Their path to freedom was littered with the bodies of those who didn't survive the journey, and then they were herded into refugee camps where clean drinking water, food, and access to medical care were scarce. There were significant challenges once those people resettled in other countries. Culture shock, language barriers, and xenophobia made life challenging in their new homes. One of those Cambodians who left their homeland and resettled in the U.S. is Tay Nelms. Tay's family left Cambodia when she was a young child, and today she's going to share her experiences and tell us not only about the difficulties war refugees must overcome, but also how Cambodian Americans have contributed to U.S. society. Welcome, Tay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank you for being willing to share your story. Um, one of the sad things is that the, the group that are called refugees really doesn't diminish in size over time. There's always new groups of people who are escaping sociopolitical violence, religious oppression, and, and things like that. Uh, so I think it's important for people that have experienced it to come back and let the rest of us know sure. that you are, um, that you can make a positive contribution to society, and that really um, remind us that at one time or another, all of us have ancestors that were refugees in some way. Absolutely. So thank you for uh, being willing to share with us. Uh, tell us your story about how you came from Cambodia to Thailand and then ultimately to Hawaii. Oh, it's a long story. Um, so, where do I begin? I was a little girl. Um, we left Cambodia when I was four. Um, I remember during the peaceful times, um, but during the war, I remember our family running into different areas. I don't know where my parents were at, but I was with um, grandma, we call Yai. Um, I don't think she's my biological grandma, but, um, but everybody in the Asian culture were um, grandparents or uncles and brothers and sisters. So I just remember hiding, um, hearing gunshots above my head and hiding in the rice paddies because there's a, a, it's like a ditch. And so we hid from place to place and just remember being hungry and tired and just wanting to, to stay in one place. And I didn't understand why we had to keep moving and why my family had to be separated. Um, and then next thing I know, uh, we made a long trek and um, we just walked in single file lines, day and night. Um, and I don't remember too much, um, but one of the vivid images that I have was hiding behind a big tree and seeing the soldiers rush by. The look on my mother's face just, I mean, I was four years old. It just looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. Um, I didn't know what death meant at the time, but 
she just said shh and I remember not just freezing and moving alongside the tree as the soldiers moved um, and then I don't know how much time has passed but we finally they were gone and um, and then we picked up our stuff and we kept on moving um, and then other images were just bedtime stories that my mother would tell us so instead of reading books she would tell us how we escaped to kind of instill in us and that was her gift to us um, because she didn't come from an educated family and mm -hmm. so storytelling and verbal communication was very important so sorry no no it's just such an emotional topic even to this day yeah I'm sure it is and see that's that's why I wanted to have you on the show uh, to share these experiences because uh, as I was saying to you before those of us who were born and raised in the US have no idea of you know we I can't imagine having to flee my home with nothing but the clothes on my back to run with brothers and sisters you know mm -hmm. carry those who cannot walk uh, in order to stay safe it's it's a foreign and almost unfathomable concept to, to folks like me who have lived in safety our whole lives um, so it's important to have those stories and just like Cambodian culture has a rich oral history it's important for you I think to tell us those stories mm -hmm. because we can read books all day long but to see the look in someone's eyes as they relate the story or to see your tears means more than we'll get from any any book so and even for me um, you know as we've spoken before um, I've I've become complacent as well too um, our lives just get so busy and you know and then on New Year's and then we come together and we commemorate all uh, what we've been through and and all the lives lost um, but it's 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 not enough um, and we also realize that uh, the education system uh, we haven't we didn't we still haven't learned what we went through in the history books mm -hmm. it's still for whatever reason it's not in the education books and so it becomes even more important and especially as you also know um, you know my dad passed away last summer and so with the first Cambodian um, Americans uh, with their passing it just that that knowledge and those experiences are also gone forever mm -hmm. and so it's important to just kind of keep talking about it um, and so it was it was a, a gift for my mother to um, to take the time to tell us what what we've been through mm -hmm. um, so just to continue on with your uh, question how we came here so we finally got to the Thai border um, kind of to backtrack to my mother said that um, there were team leaders that knew the way to to the border and so um, so people would they would ask what you know whatever you had um, you know that that would be a, a compensation for them um, and so people would just give their their savings their gold and, and whatnot um, and we didn't have much and so I mean rice was you know was was big at that time too because we didn't have food and so a lot of people gave gave the team leaders rice um, and so they would lead us um, my mom said there were about 20 or 200 families that that were in a group and of the 200 families about 50 uh, made it to the Thai Thailand border once we got to the border um, there were soldiers there and they said that you know we're not accepting any refugees not any unless you're Thai but you know you're all Cambodians um, and my mom heard on the radio um, and she's she's Thai both my grandparents were Thai uh, they um, they relocated to uh, a village called Atambong so it's kind of on the Thai border so a lot of the Cambodians there spoke Thai and vice versa um, and she said oh I hear on the radio that the UN um, declared to help the Cambodians out for all these countries to help them out if they can and so the soldiers were like well how do you you know are you Thai and she says yes I'm, I'm Thai you know I can and so um, so they let us our, they let they let our group in um, and so one by one 
Um, so eventually, uh, they were flooded with a bunch of Cambodian refugees. Um, there were several, there were different camps set up. I don't remember all of the different names. Um, Kawi Dong was, was, was one of the, the major uh, refugee camps um, based on talking to my uncles and my aunties and my parents. Um, there were uh, various humanitarian relief efforts, the Red Cross, um, all available to help. Um, and uh, one of the memories that I remember was that probably clouded, um, but once a week we would get food rations. Um, we, we got rice, bananas were my favorite, so everybody got um, like a, what is that called, like a bunch of uh, bananas, and I would go to each family's rations and steal one banana. Um, and I asked my mom if that memory was, you know, in fact true, if I had just made it up. And she said, oh, no, everybody knew you stole the banana. But no one said anything. Um, I also remember, sorry, it's just kind of bits and, and clips um, as I'm remembering things. Um, I remember just being so tired walking from Cambodia to Thailand, and um, but always remembering that an aunt or uncle would always pick me up and carry me. I don't know who they are, but... Mm -hmm. And I just know that now, you know, as an adult, I mean, sometimes kind of random, but I'm, I'm working out and I'm so tired and I can't lift another weight and there's just no way I can lift another five pounds, but these people are, are you know, running for their lives and they're so tired and malnourished and hungry and yet they found it in their hearts to, to pick me up. And mm -hmm. so I never, I don't remember a time when, when I was tired and no one no one agreed to pick me up. Mm. There's always somebody there. That's nice. Um, and yeah. it's good that you had uh, that companionship because they're, they could just as easily have said, no, I run faster when I'm not mm -hmm. hanging on to extra weight. So yeah. if you can't make it on your own, too bad. Yeah. Did you get, ever get in trouble for stealing those bananas? I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, an adult no, could have caught you yeah. and smacked your hand or... No. Um, no, and, and I probably stole more than just one banana from each family because I just remember, okay, I, I know it's bad to steal, so I would... Um, and I don't see anybody around, so I would just take one banana from my family's side, even though, you know, we're not supposed to pick them up yet. And then I would go to the next family's rations and I would eat theirs and I think I think at one point I went around in a circle and I was still hungry so I I, I took the second banana from those families but um, so like my mom said um, everybody knew what I was doing but no one said anything because how can you reprimand a child who's hungry yeah that's true and I think that maybe that's another experience that many of us don't understand. I mean, granted, there are families in the U.S. that have food insecurity, uh, but but not to that degree where they're feeling compelled maybe to to take things that belong to others. Right. You know, this has been this conversation has been flying by so quickly that I just got a whisper in my ear from our beloved voice in Houston that we need to stop um, and do some housekeeping. So sit tight. Uh, we will be back. Uh, in 60 seconds, so take a look at some of the other programming that we have here on Think Tech Hawaii. Working together, we'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just gonna scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. 
on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we are talking with Tay Nelms about her experiences of the killing fields and then coming to the U.S. So, Tay, how long did it take uh, your family to get ready for resettlement in the U.S.? So, I was four years old when we left, and uh, six years old by the time we were sponsored and moved to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, I mean, I wrote it down at some point when my mom was telling me the story, um, you know, several months at, certain, at such camp, and I mean, it could be four to six months at certain camps. Um, so it was Thailand within various refugee camps, and then the Philippines, um, so we were there I don't know how long, um, and but that was like the last holding place, and then from there, we caught a plane to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And were you sponsored by family and friends? We were sponsored by the Lutheran Church. Wow. Um, so that's kind of a fascinating story in itself. Um, so the the man that was responsible for um, the vision was Pastor Lawrence Roller. Um, he's a retired colonel um, from the Air Force. He was a part of Operation New, New Hope, um, stationed at Wake Island. And it was after the Vietnam War where um, they set up a humanitarian relief efforts to help the Vietnamese refugees. And so he was one of the first people to welcome the Vietnamese to America and seeing just uh, how helpless, hopeless, um, sadness, but so much gratitude that they're uh, that they're safe in a new country um, uh, has inspired him to help when um, when he heard about the Cambodian refugees just fleeing from our own government, um, mm -hmm. and when the UN gave the approval. Um, to help the Cambodian refugees, uh, the pr President Nixon at the time um, also encouraged uh, the U.S. to help. Um, at the time, there were, I think there's still nine, nine resettlement agencies um, that was authorized by the federal government to help. And so the Lutheran, the LIRS, the Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services, um, they were they were started during, from what I remember, from what he told me, um, during World War I to mm -hmm. help the displaced Lutheran. Uh, they have since opened up their mission to help all humankind in need. And so with that, uh, he encouraged his con congregation to help if they're able to. Um, Mary and Dana Lundquist, they were founders of True Value Hawaii, They've been watching, um, they're watching 60 Minutes and saw um, the clippings of how, uh, of the Cambodian refugees and went to our pastor and said that they'd like to help out. And so pastor, having been in contact with the LIRS, um, I believe he said their national headquarters is in New York. And so he immediately put them in contact with LIRS and, um, they were able to, to expedite the sponsorship. It could take years, but it was within a matter of a couple of months. I mean, I could be exaggerating, but it was, I mean, that was how fast he was able to expedite it. So, um, yeah, so the so Mary and Dana Lundquist sponsored um, the Yin family. So they're the first wave of Cambodians to arrive to mm -hmm. Hawaii. And that was your family? That's my uncle and my aunt. Um, and then from there, um, my dad's eldest brother, um, Uncle Tan Plong, and his family arrived. And then 
and then the chans and then just everybody once we got here everybody was sponsoring each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. chain immigration yes <laughs> and now we may lose that ability to you know if the if the president has his way he seems to think that chain immigration is not a good thing because it brings in say uh, folks of questionable uh, moral fiber mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about uh, the Lonquists and how I mean it was more than just financial sponsorship right because they didn't they also because they owned a retail store mm -hmm. they were able to employ a bunch of the folks that came over yes tell us about that yes um, absolutely so Pastor asked the Lundquist, you know, how are you going, what's your plan once the Cambodians are here? Um, where, where are they going to work and where are they going to eat? And um, Mr. Lundquist just said, well, you know, we have this store that we can employ the dads to work in our store. Um, and they would sit alongside with us and have dinner and we'd take them to church and um, they'd be part of our family. And so with that, Pastor knew that it was the right fit because he was worried about, you know, a sponsor just taking a family in and then just, you know, and, and not, um, and because of the cultural and communication barriers, he, he worried about um, the Cambodians fitting in. Um, but it just, it it was a perfect match because the, the Lundquist never saw the Cambodians as anything else but family, an mm -hmm. extent, extension of their family. Yeah, I could imagine that there may be a fear of exploitation, perhaps, and even maybe trafficking if, if people are not um, motivated by, mm -hmm. by higher types of, of values. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the screening was very thorough, and that's why Pastor, and with his experience um, with the Vietnamese refugees, he uh, he was very careful in uh, selecting the families that would help out. Mm -hmm. So you're six years old, you're here in the U.S. now, you're attending school, you're learning to, you're you're being socialized into the American slash U.S. slash Hawaii way of doing things. What sorts of challenges did you find individually, just as a kid trying to fit in in school? Wow. Um, you know, Hawaii is known to be the, the melting pot, um, but I guess as the newest group of immigrants to come, um, you're you're an outcast. I remember not having any friends. Um, no one knew what the Cambodians were. They always thought I was Chinese or, um, or even, even at that time, they didn't know what, um, or they didn't even know much about Thailand or, or Vietnam. It was just all new to everybody. And I lived in, we grew up in Makiki, so it was a very uh, vibrant immigrant, neighbor neighborhood um i went to queen kaahumanu elementary school um the teachers were great um they always tried to uh to make me fit in um but in the beginning it was it was hard because i didn't speak the language um i remember though they did have a program i was in the third grade and it's called lips i don't think they have it anymore but it's of like English as a second language, um, language improvement program center, I think. And uh, so it was myself and a few of my um, Cambodian neighbors were in it, um, a Chinese student. So we, we were in that class together um, while everybody, I don't know what all, all the other kids did, I think probably recess or, <laughs> but, um, but we, practiced English and learned to read. Um, and then by the time I got into the fourth and fifth grade, I was in the regular reading class. And um, sixth grade, I was in the more advanced class. Um, and then I found another sponsor, um, and his name is Mr. Steve Lane. Um, he has been helping 
disadvantaged students in Hawaii obtain scholarships. Mm -hmm. And so I met him through another Cambodian family um, and went to his house. Um, they just gave me a bunch of books to read. I never did really have the time to read all of them, but um, uh, but next thing I know, he had me take a test to go to Iolani. So I went to Iolani summer school. Um, I didn't do very well, and then I think uh, not to not to place any blame on my public schooling or anything like that. I, um, but I didn't I didn't score high enough to go to Iolani. But the headmaster of Iolani and the headmaster of St. Andrews Priory were brothers at the time, and so I went to Priory, went to St. Andrews Priory the following fall. Mm -hmm. And then you graduated. And then I graduated. From Priory. I actually graduated, another long story, um, I actually graduated from a boarding school on the East Coast that Mr. Lane um, helped the sponsor or found the monies for me. Mm -hmm. To attend. Wow. So there's a lot of a lot of people. Just... You've had tremendous blessings come your way. I, yeah, I did. We're starting I to did. run out of time, so can you just briefly um, tell us uh, that camera? Um, look into the camera and tell us, tell all the people that are watching, what we can do to support people who are who come to this country or come to Hawaii in the position that you were in? Like, what made it easier for you to become so successful as, as a war refugee? Okay, I'm gonna try not to cry again. <laughs> well, I have plenty of Kleenex, don't worry about that. Um, sorry. It's okay. Take a breath. I guess I just feel uh, so much gratitude because if it wasn't for all these, a chain of events, a chain of people with their vision and going through their own obstacles, I wouldn't be here, my family wouldn't be here. But there is just a select few that really made a difference, and it wasn't it, it wasn't necessarily money or it, it was believing in us no matter what, and um, and being our friends and and seeing the hope. They lost some friends along the way, um, but they knew it was the right thing to do to help the less fortunate. And as a result, I know that I've reaped the fruits of their labor. Um, I just can't thank these people enough. Um, and it, it all started with the UN saying enough is enough. There's too many lives being killed. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it uh, was an incentive for all the other countries to help the Cambodian refugees. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, Tay, thank you for sharing your story, and, and thank you for your tears, too, um, and your gratitude. You know, there are always people fleeing violence and persecution. It's easy to forget that those we call refugees seek the same things we do, safety, security, and a peaceful place in which to live, work, and raise their families. While it's hard for U.S. residents to picture themselves as needing to flee their homes in order to save themselves and their families from violence, millions of people around the world aren't so fortunate. For those whose countries have been torn by war and political and religious persecution, there are few ap options apart from trying to escape. We need to remember that these people are human beings who want the same things we do for our families. The way we treat those who have been dispossessed is not an indication of who they are, it's a reflection of our own characters 
and our ability to operationalize the Aloha Spirit in our daily lives. Um, on behalf of all of the people here at Think Tech Hawaii, uh, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. Uh, this is Working Together, and we will be back in two weeks. Till then, take care.